Let us start with an introduction to HVAC system. There are three main sections involved in this system. 1. Cooling system. 2. Heating system. 3. Air handling unit. Cooling system. The cooling system is used to reduce the temperature of the environment that the HVAC system is controlling. The components of this system are Chiller Cooling tower Condenser pump Primary pump Secondary pump Heating system The heating system is used to increase the temperature of the environment that the HVAC system is controlling. The components of the heating system are Boiler Primary pump Secondary pump Air handling unit The AHU controls the ventilation and temperature in a building by controlling the air flow capacity. The components of this section are Cooling coil Heating coil Air filter Duct work Supply fan Return fan Inlet damper Exhaust damper Return damper the cooling provided by the HVAC system is explained as follows. The warm water rejected by the chiller is sent to the cooling tower through the condenser pump. The water is then cooled by the cooling tower fans. The cooled water in the cooling tower basin is then passed to the chiller to remove the heat from the refrigerant and allows it to produce chilled water. The secondary pump pumps the chilled water from the chiller to the AHU cooling coil. Fresh air blows in from the inlet damper. This air flows across the cooling coils and its temperature is reduced. The water in the cooling coil takes up the heat from the fresh air blown through it and this warmed water is sent back to the chiller by means of a primary pump for chilling. The chill air flowing out of the cooling coils is moved into the duct work by means of a supply fan. Through the duct work, chilled air is distributed to the individual zones. The warm air in the zones are sent back through the return fan. A part of this air is sent out as exhaust. The other part is fed back into the system through return dampers to be used for cooling. If heating is required the hot water from the boiler is fed to the heating coil using a secondary pump. The water passes through the coil, loses heat, and is fed back to the boiler by means of a primary pump. The rest of the flow is the same as in the case of cooling. Hi again I will go today through the main components of a chiller, and you will see the role of each part. I will also elaborate that on the pH diagram of the refrigeration cycle. I am going to start with the most important component which is the compressor. Here I have a model for a water-cooled chiller. The compressor is the prime mover, it creates a pressure difference to move the refrigerant around the system. It is always located between the evaporator and the condenser. Here is the electric motor driving the compressor. You can see here a dismantled centrifugal compressor, showing the main parts of it like the stator and rotor of the motor, the shaft connecting the rotor with the impeller, and the necessary bearings. So, our compressor here is of centrifugal type. There are different types of compressors like screw, scroll and reciprocating compressors. For larger capacities like 300 tons of refrigeration or more, the centrifugal compressors are selected. The compressor work is elaborated on the chart from points 1 to 2. The refrigerant enter the compressor in gas state at low temperature low pressure, and it exits the compressor to the condenser at high pressure high temperature.
refrigerant gas enters the condenser at point 2 and exits the condenser at point 3. What happens inside the condenser? We will see now. The purpose of the condenser is to remove heat from the refrigerant which was built up in the evaporator. There are two main types of condensers, air-cooled as in the case of air-cooled chillers and split systems, and water-cooled condensers as in our case in the water-cooled chillers. Hot water leaves the condenser and enters the cooling tower, and due to the evaporation process taking place in the cooling tower, the water leaves cooling tower and enters the condenser at a lower temperature. The cycle then repeats itself. It is important to know that the refrigerant and the water do not mix together, they are kept separated by the pipe wall. This is a shell and tube section of the condenser where the water flows inside the tubes and the refrigerant flows on the outside. However, in the case of air-cooled chillers, there is no cooling towers, but instead air is blown across the exposed condenser pipes to remove heat from the refrigerant flowing inside the condenser tubes. The refrigerant now exits the condenser at point 3 and enter the expansion valve. The expansion valve is located between the condenser and the evaporator. Its purpose is to expand the refrigerant reducing its pressure and increase its volume, which will allow it to pick up the unweighted heat in the evaporator. The expansion valve is elaborated on the chart from points 3 to 4. At point 3 the refrigerant is at high temperature high pressure, it enters the evaporator at point 4 at low temperature low pressure. Here we have the evaporator, it is located between the expansion valve and the compressor. Its purpose is to collect the unwanted heat from the water coming from the buildings. The return from the buildings enter the evaporator at around 14 degrees Celsius, where it gives its heat to the refrigerant, and then exits the evaporator at around 4 degrees Celsius, which is adequate to cool the buildings. The evaporator is elaborated on the chart from points 4 to 1. Refrigerant enters the evaporator at point 4 in a mixed state of liquid and gas, and exits the evaporator in the gas state to enter the compressor, and the cycle repeats itself again. Hi again. In this video we will learn the different types of chillers that are used in the market. There are essentially two major categories of commercial chilling technologies, compression and absorption. Let's start with the compression chillers. There are three types of compressors used in compression chillers, centrifugal, rotary and reciprocating. Centrifugal compressors. The majority of centrifugal chillers are water-cooled, and it is often used for medium to large cooling loads from 200 to 6,000 tons of refrigeration. You will rarely find a centrifugal compressor in air-cooled chillers. Centrifugal compressors are usually driven with electric motors, but it is also possible to drive chillers directly with reciprocating engines, combustion, or steam turbines. What about the working principle of centrifugal compressors? Like centrifugal pumps, an impeller provides the force to compress the refrigerant vapor. The low-pressure refrigerant vapor enters the eye of the impeller. The rotating impeller adds kinetic energy to the flow which is then converted to an increase in pressure by slowing the flow through a diffuser. Reciprocating Compressors Reciprocating compressors operate similar to a car engine, it uses a piston driven from a crankshaft. The refrigerant is drawn into the cylinder during the downstroke and compressed in the upstroke. These compressors could be found on air-cooled and water-cooled chillers up to 200 tons of refrigeration. The third type is the rotary compressors, which could use one of the following. Scrolls Rotating vanes Or helical screw the helical screw is the more common type, they are used on both air and water cooled chillers. These chillers are typically available in 70 to 400 tons of refrigeration. Screw compressors work by using two interlocking rotating helical rotors to compress the refrigerant. As a conclusion, the only difference between centrifugal, reciprocating and screw chillers is the compression technology adopted by the compressor, and all the rest are the same.
To know more about how vapor compression chillers work, please visit the link in the description below because I already explained that in a previous video. Absorption chillers. Absorption cycle uses heat to generate cooling using two media. A refrigerant and an absorbent. Water lithium bromide is the most common refrigerant absorbent media pair, but other pairs can be used. The absorption process uses an absorber, generator, pump and recuperative heat exchanger to replace the compressor in the vapor compression cycle. Note that the absorption chiller must operate at very low pressures, about 1 over 100th of normal atmospheric pressure, for the water to vaporize at a cold enough temperature, example at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, to produce 44 degrees Fahrenheit chilled water. The absorption cycle, illustrated here, can be summarized as follows. In the generator, gas, steam or hot water is used to boil a solution of refrigerant absorbent, water lithium bromide. Refrigerant vapor is released and the absorbent solution is concentrated. Next step in the condenser. The refrigerant vapor released in the generator is drawn into the condenser. Cooling water cools and condenses the refrigerant. Heat will be rejected from condenser to the cooling tower stream. Evaporator. Liquid refrigerant is dropped in pressure when it flows through an orifice into the evaporator. Due to the lower pressure in the evaporator, flashing takes place. The flashing cools the remaining liquid refrigerant down to the saturation temperature of the refrigerant at the pressure present within the evaporator. Heat is transferred from the chilled water to the refrigerant, thereby cooling the chilled water and vaporizing the refrigerant. Absorber Refrigerant vapor from the evaporator is drawn to the absorber section by the low pressure resulting from absorption of the refrigerant into the absorbent. Cooling water removes the heat released when the refrigerant vapor returns to the liquid state in the absorption process. The diluted solution is circulated back to the generator. Heat exchanger The heat exchanger transfers heat from the relatively warm concentrated solution being returned from the generator to the absorber and the dilute solution being transferred back to the generator. Transferring heat between the solutions reduces the amount of heat that has to be added in the generator and reduces the amount of heat that has to be rejected from the absorber. When talking about air-cooled versus water-cooled chillers, we are referring to the type of condenser selected. Air-cooled chillers have condensers that use ambient air to cool hot refrigerant. A fan blows ambient air through the fins and over the outside of the tubes, cooling the refrigerant flowing inside. The excess heat is released to the air. On the other hand, water-cooled chillers use water to cool the refrigerant in the condenser. Water-cooled condensers are typically tube-in-shell or plate-type heat exchangers in which water from a cooling tower cools the refrigerant. The refrigerant and cooling water do not come in direct contact with each other. Rather they flow in separate passageways within the heat exchanger which are in close contact for efficient heat transfer. In tube and shell, the water flows inside the tubes and absorbs the excess heat from the refrigerant vapor flowing around the tubes, thus lowering the refrigerant to the necessary temperature for use in the system. In the plate type heat exchanger, the ceiling between the plates on the condenser alternates between laser welds and gaskets. Vapor condenses in the welded channel and the cooling water passes through the gasket channel. In terms of energy efficiency, water-cooled chillers are typically more energy efficient than air-cooled chillers. The refrigerant condensing temperature in an air-cooled chiller is dependent on the ambient dry bulb temperature. On the other hand, the condensing temperature in a water-cooled chiller is dependent on the condenser water temperature, which is dependent on the ambient wet bulb temperature. Since the design wet bulb temperature is often significantly lower than the dry bulb temperature, the refrigerant condensing temperature and pressure in a water-cooled chiller can be lower than in an air-cooled chiller. For example, at an outdoor design condition of 95 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb temperature, 78 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb temperature, a cooling tower delivers 85 degrees Fahrenheit water to the water-cooled condenser. This results in a refrigerant condensing temperature of approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
At these same outdoor conditions, the refrigerant condensing temperature in an air-cooled condenser is approximately 125 degrees Fahrenheit. From the refrigeration cycle pH diagram, a lower condensing temperature, and therefore a lower condensing pressure, means that the compressor needs to do less work and consumes less energy. That's the work to be done by the compressor on the air-cooled chiller. And that's the work to be done by the compressor on the water-cooled chiller. This efficiency advantage of water-cooled chiller over air-cooled chiller may lessen at part load conditions because the dry bulb temperature tends to drop faster than the wet bulb temperature as. The air-cooled chiller may benefit from greater condenser relief. And its efficiency will be competitive to water-cooled chiller in this region if we take into consideration the additional cooling tower and condenser pump energy costs that will add up to the water-cooled chiller. In terms of lifespan, air-cooled chillers last 15 to 20 years, while water-cooled chillers last 20 to 30 years. Fan coil unit is a device consisting of a heat exchanger coil and a fan. Fan coil units falls principally into two main types, blow-through and draw-through. As the name suggests, in the first type the fans are fitted behind the heat exchanger, and in the other type the fans are fitted in front the coil such that they draw air through it. Draw-through units are considered thermally superior, as ordinarily they make better use of the heat exchanger. However, they are more expensive as they require a chassis to hold the fans whereas a blow-through unit typically consists of a set of fans bolted straight to a coil. A fan coil unit may be concealed or exposed within the room or area that it serves. An exposed fan coil unit may be wall-mounted, freestanding, or ceiling-mounted, and will typically include an appropriate enclosure to protect and conceal the fan coil unit itself. With return air grill and supply air diffuser set into that enclosure to distribute the air. A concealed fan coil unit will typically be installed within an accessible ceiling void or services zone. The return air grill and supply air diffuser, typically set flush into the ceiling, will be ducked to and from the fan coil unit and thus allows a great degree of flexibility for locating the grills to suit the ceiling layout and or the partition layout within a space. It is quite common for the return air not to be ducked and to use the ceiling void as a return air plenum. Fan coil units are divided into two types, two-pipe fan coil units or four-pipe fan coil units. Two-pipe fan coil units as in our case here have one supply and one return pipe. The supply pipe supplies either cold or hot water to the unit depending on the time of year. For pipe fan coil units have two supply pipes and two return pipes. This allows either hot or cold water to enter the unit at any given time. So, let us see the working principle of fan coil units. Assume we are in summer and the hot space need to be cooled. Once the FCU is turned on, the fan starts and the hot air in the space is sucked toward the FCU from the return grill. Air first enters the FCU through the filter. Any dust carried by the return air will stick on the filter surface allowing only clean air to exit the filter and move forward. Hence, this filter requires cleaning on scheduled basis, this is often done on monthly or quarterly basis by simply pulling the filter by hand, washing it and replacing it back. In modern buildings with a BMS system, a differential pressure transmitter is installed on the duct transmitting the pressure difference before and after the filter. Once the pressure differential exceeds the set point, the filter is then removed to be cleaned. Filtered air moves forward toward the coil. Air moves through the fins, and chilled water moves through the tubes. The coil receives the chilled water either from an air-cooled chiller installed on the roof of the building or from a central plant. Beginning in its 2016 version, ASHRAE Standard 90.1 now requires chilled water cooling coils be designed for at least a 15 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference between the leaving and entering water. And the leaving water temperature must be no colder than 57 degrees Fahrenheit at design conditions. As an example, for the leaving water temperature to be 57 degrees Fahrenheit, the coil in figure 1 is selected with a 42 degrees Fahrenheit entering water temperature. This would comply with the minimum 15 degrees Fahrenheit delta T requirement. 
Let us assume the entering air conditions are 80 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb and 67 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb, which equates to a 60 degrees Fahrenheit dew point. The air leaving the coil should be cooled to a temperature less than the dew point in order for the water vapor to condense on the coil surface and therefore remove the latent heat from the air. In our case it is being cooled to 53 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that water vapor will be condensing out of the air to reduce its humidity. The fan coil unit will contain a purpose-designed drip tray installed below the coil with drain connection for this purpose. Normally a drain pipe is connected to this drain connection which transfers the condensate to the nearest floor drain. The nice, cooled and non-humid air is then transferred to the space through the fan to create a comfort environment. The speed of this fan is controlled from the space thermostat by simply increasing or decreasing the fan speed. Another pressure differential transmitter could be installed along the fan and connected to the BMS system to give an indication of damaged belt in case of zero pressure difference. The thermostat also regulates the chilled water flow using this control valve, which open to increase the chilled water flow when the space temperature goes above the desired temperature, and closes to decrease or stop the chilled water flow when the space temperature reaches the desired temperature. PICV innovation came as a result of the continuous problems in HVAC systems that uses the conventional control valves. The problem with the conventional control valves is that even after a system is manually balanced, it is only balanced at full flow position. With variable flow pumps, the flow rates in the distribution pipework fluctuate to match demand. Therefore, the available pressure at individual terminal units varies. This variation in available pressure has the effect of changing the flow rate through the terminal sub-circuit, that is an increase in pressure gives an increased flow rate. This fact is evident in the basic flow formula, flow equals Cb square root delta P. As the pressure differential, delta P, increases, and the open area of the valve stays the same, therefore Cv remains unchanged as you can notice from this graph, then the flow has to increase. The only time we want to change the flow in the coil is when the load requirement changes. Then the actuator should respond to the signal received from the thermostat by changing the valve's open area. Changes in flow without a change in actuator position is what to be avoided, and that what PICV came to solve. A PICV is best described as two valves in one, a standard two-way control valve, and a balancing valve. Here is a simplified explanation of PICV operation using a two-valve system. The second valve, V2 in the graphic below, regulates the pressure differential across the first valve, V1 using a rolling diaphragm element counteracted by a spring. The first valve is a calibrated variable orifice device adjusted by the actuator, similar to a standard modulating control valve. The diaphragm reacts to the system and regulates the pressure differential across the actuated control valve orifice to maintain its flow rate. Let's demonstrate how PICV works. First part, comfort control. Let's assume we set the thermostat in our room to 24 degrees. With time the load increases and the room temperature increase as well. The thermostat then sends a signal to the actuator to open the valve and therefore to increase the flow towards the terminal unit. When the room returns to the required temperature, the thermostat again sends the signal to the PICV to close and decrease the flow. Second part, the pressure control. Pump changes speed to meet the demand change in building. Let's assume the pump speed is increased. The pressure in the entire building is then affected. But in some areas in this building there are no demand change, so instead of giving unnecessary extra flow to the terminal units which leads to energy loss, the piston and spring operate to maintain a constant differential pressure P1 minus P2 across the control surface and therefore maintains the flow constant across the terminal unit despite system pressure fluctuations. Finally, we have to know that in order for the PICV to operate as intended, a minimum delta P defined by the valve manufacturer should be always available across it. Hi gents! Welcome to this robust course about VRF systems. By the end of this video, you will have a rigid understanding of the VRF systems and how do they work. Always be reminded to press the subscribe button so you will not miss any video in the future.
Let us have a look on the different sections we are going to cover through our video. First section is a general introduction to VRF systems. Then we are going to see how the VRF systems works. Then we will go through the different types of VRF systems. And last section is about the hybrid VRF systems and their working principle. Variable Refrigerant Flow VRF, also known as Variable Refrigerant Volume VRV, is an HVAC technology invented by Dakin Industries in 1982. Here is a photo of the first VRV units. Variable refrigerant flow is a technology that circulates only the minimum amount of refrigerant needed during a single heating or cooling period. This mechanism introduced the opportunity for end users to individually control several air conditioning zones at one time. Here is a timeline graph showing the growth of VRF systems. So, in 1982 Dakin invented this technology. Later of 1980s other manufacturers entered this business and remarketed it as VRF because VRV is a trademark of Dakin. This technology reached Europe by 1987 and USA markets by early 2000s. By 2007, VRF systems are installed in Japan on 50% of mid-size office buildings and 33% of large commercial buildings. A study on 2020 estimated that China accounts for 67% of world's VRF market. By today, there are more than 40 global manufacturers of VRF systems, on top comes Mitsubishi Electric and Daikin. A typical VRF system consists of an outdoor unit, several indoor units, refrigerant piping running from the outdoor to the indoors, using RefNet joints, which are copper distributors and pipes. And communication wiring. Communication wiring comprises a two-wired cable chain from the outdoor to all indoors, creating an internal closed-loop network. This is an essential part of any VRF installation. As for the control, each indoor is controlled by its own wired control panel, while there are some possibilities for wireless remotes and centralized controllers, enabling controlling all indoors from one location. How does VRF HVAC work? The operation logic of the VRF is fully built in inside the system and is proprietary for each VRF manufacturer. The system gets inputs from the user, example, desired comfort temperature. And from the surroundings, example, outside ambient temperature. According to that data, it implements its logic in order to get to the desired comfort conditions, utilizing optimal power consumptions. Let's see a typical example. At the beginning, the system is in standstill condition, this means everything is turned off. Once a user turns one of the indoors on by its local remote, the outdoor gets noted regarding it, and starts working. At this point, it will examine the outdoor temperature conditions, the operating indoor requirements such as operation mode and set point temperature, and will operate the compressor at the exact level, required to comply with the indoor requirements. When another indoor unit is turned on, the outdoor recalculates the requirements from all the indoors and will increase the compressor's output according to the required level of demand. This process is constantly occurring with any change performed in the HVAC system. As described, this system is fully automatic and regulates its power consumption based on the demand arriving from the indoor units and outside prevailing conditions. The modern VRF technology uses an inverter driven scroll compressor. Here is a short animation showing a cross-section of scroll compressors and their working principle. The inverter scroll compressors changes the speed to follow the variations in the total cooling heating load. The capacity control range can be as low as 6% to 100%. Let's see how the inverter scroll compressor works. It is good to know that the relation between the speed and capacity is almost linear on scroll compressors. That is, double the speed and the capacity is almost doubled. For periods of high cooling demand, the input frequency of the compressor is increased. For periods of lower cooling demand, a lower input frequency is supplied to the compressor. Periods of normal cooling demand uses the standard 50 or 60 Hz frequencies. Maximum required cooling capacity is achieved using 90 Hz for scroll compressor speed. 
On the other hand, minimum required cooling capacity is achieved using 30 Hz for scroll compressor speed. To run the compressor at higher frequency than the power supply frequency 230 volts 50 Hz, it is necessary to supply higher voltage to the motor. For 90 Hz frequency we need to supply a higher voltage to the motor and is calculated as follows. Four hundred and fifteen volts is the supply voltage to the variable frequency drive at fifty hertz. This graph shows the relationship for scroll compressor voltage, capacity, and speeds between thirty and ninety hertz. Thirty hertz is the minimum speed required for proper compressor lubrication, while ninety hertz is the maximum speed to prevent oil carryover. So, with the inverter technology a large capacity compressor operating at variable speed replaces three small compressors in a standard solution. Following illustration shows the difference between a conventional HVAC compressor that runs at maximum operation load until the desired temperature is reached and turn off until cooling is required to reach the set temperature again. So, the compressor is continuously turned on and off. On the other hand, an inverter compressor will continue to run, but only use the required amount of energy to maintain the desired temperature. This variable speed operation is not only more efficient, but also maintains more precise temperatures. In addition, this continuous smooth operation of the compressor translates to fewer maintenance calls and a longer lifespan for the motor itself. There are three VRF system types. Cooling only systems, those systems can only cool. Heating is not available. Heat pump systems also known as two-pipe VRF, allow heating or cooling in all indoor units, but not simultaneous heating and cooling. All the indoor units can either heat or cool, but not at the same time. Heat recovery systems also known as three-pipe VRF, allow heating and cooling in all indoor terminal devices simultaneously. Those systems are the most sophisticated ones. Let us see how a VRF heat recovery system works. In this system, each outdoor air-cooled condenser is connected via three pipes to an indoor heat recovery unit. A high-pressure gas refrigerant line for heating, a high-pressure liquid refrigerant line for cooling, and a low-pressure gas suction line for return to the outdoor unit. Each indoor heat recovery unit works together with the indoor terminal units and respective thermostats in each zone to determine if they require heating or cooling. An indoor terminal unit in heating mode is supplied with high-pressure gas refrigerant from the heat recovery unit. The heating mode indoor terminal unit acts like a condenser and the refrigerant exits as a high-pressure liquid and proceeds back to the heat recovery unit. The heat recovery unit combines high-pressure liquid exiting heating zones with high-pressure liquid from the outdoor condensing unit and directs it to any indoor terminal units that are in cooling. The cooling mode indoor terminal unit acts like an evaporator and the refrigerant exits as low-pressure gas, returns to the heat recovery unit, and then proceeds to the outdoor condensing unit to begin the cycle again. Our last section is about hybrid VRF systems. Hybrid VRF is a unique two-pipe heat recovery VRF system that replaces refrigerant with water between the hybrid branch circuit controller and the indoor units. At the center of the system is the hybrid branch controller HBC, which is connected to the outdoor heat recovery unit via traditional refrigerant piping. On your right hand is a simple illustration of this HBC unit. There are three main parts in the HBC. A. Are the heat exchangers. B. Are inverter-driven pumps. C. Are the valve blocks. The HBC acts as the brains to the system. The outdoor unit delivers a mixture of liquid and hot gaseous refrigerant to it. This mixture passes through a plate heat exchanger to heat water by condensing the gas, and then the liquid refrigerant passes to a second plate heat exchanger to provide cooling. The key difference between a more traditional VRF and the newer hybrid VRF system is that in a hybrid VRF system, the need for leak detection is removed entirely as it uses water in place of refrigerant in the occupied spaces. Therefore, any risk to occupants and property under the EN378 guidelines are removed. 
With F-gas regulations becoming more strict, there's also the benefit that the HVRF uses both 30% less refrigerant than a traditional VRF and is entirely R32 compliant. Let us list some of the main VRF advantages. In terms of comfort, the main advantage of a variable refrigerant flow system is its ability to respond individually to fluctuations in space load conditions. The user can set the ambient temperature of each room as per his requirements, and the system will automatically adjust the refrigerant flow to suit the requirement. From business point of view, VRF systems can generate separate billing that makes individualized billing easier. Design flexibility. A single condensing unit can be connected to wide range of indoor units of varying capacity. Example 0.5 to 8 tons duct or ductless configurations such as ceiling recessed, wall-mounted, and floor console. Current products enable up to 48 indoor units to be supplied by a single condensing unit. In terms of energy efficiency, VRF systems use variable speed compressors inverter technology with 10 to 100% capacity range that provides unmatched flexibility for zoning to save energy. Field testing has indicated that this technology can reduce the energy consumption by as much as 30 to 40% a year compared to package or split systems. Here is graph showing the annual average efficiencies for each of the HVAC technologies for a study made in Dubai by the Regulatory and Supervisory Bureau for Electricity and Water. Hi gents! In today's video, I'll go through two of the most used pumps in HVAC industry and suction pumps and split case pumps. And suction pumps are single suction, that means the fluid enters the impeller from one side only. And suction pumps can either be closed or flexible coupled. A flexible coupled end suction pump as in our case here, has the impeller and the motor shaft separated by a flexible coupling. A closed coupled pump has the impeller directly mounted to the motor shaft without any coupling in between. The benefit of using a closed coupled pump is that the alignment of the motor shaft to the impeller is fixed. However, a flexible coupled pump can become misaligned during maintenance. This can create issues if not properly reassembled by trained personnel. End suction pumps are designed such that the incoming water enters the pump through the end in a horizontal manner. The water then changes direction and is discharged vertically, perpendicular to the suction. These pumps are typically installed on a solid base on the floor. An end suction pump is capable of being used in HVAC systems with capacities up to 4000 GPM and 150 feet of head. In short, the main advantages to using a closed coupled pump is the following. First, it requires less floor space within a plant room for installation. Second and most important, closed coupled pumps do not need to be aligned. This can be helpful if you have a high speed application at 3600 RPM where the alignment tolerances are tight. Split case pumps are similar to end suction pumps in that they are flexible coupled between the motor and the pump. The assembly, including the motor and pump, is rigidly mounted to a common base plate. Pump suction and discharge are arranged in the horizontal direction and are perpendicular to the shaft. Split case pumps are available either in single or double suction. To be a single suction pump, the water enters the impeller from only one side. For double suction, the fluid enters the impeller from both sides. Using double suction reduces the risk of hydraulic imbalance. The reduction of hydraulic imbalance is one of the reasons why double suction split case pumps are preferred over single suction. Split case pumps may have one impeller for single stage operation or may have multiple impellers for multi-stage operation. Multiple impellers provide increased available head within a single pump. Split case pumps are available as horizontal or vertical split case. For horizontal split case pumps, the impeller casing is usually split in the horizontal plane. For vertical split case pumps, the impeller casing is split in the vertical plane. To have the casing split is an added value to the pump because it allows full access to the impeller for maintenance. 
Split case pumps are used mostly in fire protection systems and in the HVAC industry for large capacity systems. Their capacity range is up to 25,000 GPM and 500 feet of head. Understanding centrifugal pump curves. A typical composite curve includes the pump performance curves or horsepower curves and NPSH required, which is the net positive suction head. A pump performance curve indicates how a pump will perform in regards to pressure head and flow. A curve is defined for a specific operating speed and a specific inlet outlet diameter. In our example here, this curve shows the performance at 1200 RPM for a 6 by 4 inches inlet outlet diameters. Several curves on one chart indicate the performance for various impeller diameters. In the example here, the impeller size ranges from 8 inches to 10.19 inches. These curves also tell us the possible conditions that the pump could be modified to meet in the future by installing a different impeller size. Now to read these curves, flow is indicated on the x-axis while head is indicated on the y-axis. In this example, let's say if you are pumping against a head of 24 feet using an impeller size of 9 inches, we could pump at a rate of 480 US GPM. Changing the motor speed gives us different performance curves. Let's see what happens to these curves if we selected a motor at 3600 RPM. From the first look on the chart, you can see that flow and head increased. Actually, we can predict these numbers and draw this chart using the below pump affinity laws. where subscripts 1 and 2 denote the value before and after the change. P is the power, N the speed, D the impeller diameter, and H the head. If the impeller diameter is fixed, the affinity law becomes like this. So in our case, increasing the speed three times from 1200 to 3600 means the flow on the x-axis should be multiplied by three. The head on the y-axis is increased by three square, so should be multiplied by nine. And the power curves should be multiplied by three cube or 27. These curves also shows us the shut off head, which is the head the pump would generate if operating against a closed valve. In our example here, the shut off for 9 inches impeller is approximately 34 feet. Also, these efficiency curves are provided on the pump performance curve. These efficiency curves are labeled in percentages. Now some curves will also mark the best efficiency point. This is the point on a pump's performance curves that corresponds to the highest efficiency and is usually between 80 to 85 percent of the shutoff head. At the best efficiency point, the impeller is subjected to minimum radial force promoting a smooth operation with low vibration and noise. Pump runs best at or near best efficiency point. Operating your pump outside of the recommended range will most likely shorten the pump life. A guideline is to locate the operating point between 110% and 80% of the best efficiency point flow rate. The brake horsepower curves indicate the horsepower required to operate a pump at a given point on the performance curve.
in our example here for the 9 inch impeller size and for 24 feet head and 480 US GPM flow the required horsepower is 5 horsepower we have to go for the line above the performance curve so it's 5 horsepower in our case here it is common practice to size the motor for the end of curve horsepower requirements in the example shown here even though 2 horsepower is required for a flow of 140 gpm with 40 feet head the end of curve horsepower requires a 2.5 horsepower motor to be used now the third important part of the pump curve is the net positive suction head required curve and this curve provides information about the suction characteristics of the pump at different flows the net positive suction head required gives you an indication for the minimum suction head that should be available by the pump at a certain flow to avoid cavitation issues that would be damaging to the pump and would have a negative impact on overall pump performance to better understand it let's see this example here let's consider this head as the pump and psh required H1 the NPSH available max which is the head corresponding to the maximum motor level and H2 is the NPSH available minimum which is the head corresponding to the minimum motor level now to be in the safe side at least we have to keep a margin of 0.5 meters between H2 and the NPSH required looking back at our design example flow of 480 GPM 7 feet of net positive suction head required at that condition so you have to make sure that your suction head is greater than 7 feet to avoid cavitation